Hey everyone, this is Orbital Weekly, the weekly session where we read interesting or tech articles and chat about tech on the Binary Orbit Discord server. So in this week, we read through S3 as a universal infrastructure backend written by Dravis Trabik. The idea behind the article is how traditional infrastructure services such as databases build their own storage layer on top of existing local disk storage and uh, this being an idea from the pre-cloud era. This also talks about how new startups and new services are starting to use S3 as their core persistence layer, the pros and cons of this particular idea, and how using S3 as a storage layer architecture gives so many advantages in comparison with the traditional approach. Yeah, so S3 as the universal infrastructure backend. Traditionally, cloud infrastructure services have primarily relied on local disk storage as their source of truth storage layer. If you look at it uh, at the average uh, cloud infrastructure services, you are almost guaranteed to see a storage model based on around uh, based around storing data on local SSDs such as EBS volumes. So Elastic, Kafka, RDS, MongoDB, AWS, Neptune, all of them use uh, like local SSDs, SSDs uh, like as, as, such as EBS volumes. Okay. Most of these services use local I.O. to read and write data to local disk, coupling compute and storage in a way that creates huge issues around auto scaling and cost. A few such as AWS Aurora disaggregate by having compute workers make network uh, RPC calls to a separate storage service, which then uh, reads writes to local disk. Okay, uh, so Aurora, what what it seems to do is they have. Uh, RPC calls to a separate storage service. Okay, instead of having it uh, in all of the rest of the services, they have compute and storage in the same place, and that means that every uh, all of their local uh, writes uh, reads all of them go to the, the SSD that is SSDs that are mounted on the same place where the compute exists, where wherever you are interfacing with the database, that you have most likely have the uh, the storage also, right? Uh, a lot, lot of hyper converged infrastructure, right? HCI, right? Uh, the, that is the marketing term for uh, uh, storing uh, like uh, uh, compute plus storage together, right? Uh, so that's called hyper-converged infrastructure. I'm coming from a background where my previous company, NetApp, used to sell uh, this. Uh, they, they used to sell HCI. Okay, so uh, a few such, uh, such okay, so we did that, but in either case, the service provider is writing a custom storage layer and dealing with the complexities of distributed cloud storage, including durability, uh, durability, availability, fault tolerance, and similar. Often a lot of this complexity then leaks to the user of the service. Much of the storage architecture is a holdover from historic, historical on-premise deployments, where infrastructure was static and pre-provisioned and customers were not subject to the pricing model of the cloud. Yet the cloud has not only changed these dynamics, but also offers a few, uh, offers a new storage primitive that is effectively infinitely scalable infinitely scalable available and elastic which is blob store right? so s3 is a blob store i'm now seeing many infrastructure services built around these cloud blob stores as their durable storage packet not just as a backup layer this s3 as a storage layer architecture gives you uh, so much for free as as an uh, Infrastructure, infrastructure service, separation of storage and compute, time travel, fault tolerance, infinite concurrency reads, fast recovery, better developer experience for your users. And that I think this will become the default architecture for a large percentage of cloud infrastructure services over the next decade. So this basically goes into saying uh, what are the pros of using S3 as a storage uh, storage layer, right? Uh, because uh, S3 by itself is uh, has a lot of these capabilities. You don't need to write your own storage layer for you to manage whenever you're writing a database. So it is probably better to use S3 as your primary storage layer and this is sort of the, the, the pros that they are uh, talking about. So let's explore what this architecture looks like, its benefits and some of the early examples and products built with this architecture in mind. So I mentioned in a talk in 2020 about building a cloud native database. There's a point uh, how well S3 could be leveraged would be key. I think this point is still valid today. Okay. The S3 as a persistence layer architecture. So here, okay, let's try to understand this diagram. So the vendor cloud has a control plane. Uh, the secondary storage, which is the uh, secondary storage basically has a Postgres cluster and then there are other cloud services in vendor cloud. But in customer cloud, there are uh, th there's a compute layer which is stateless, right? Which is basically you have work workers. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of uh, correlating this with like serverless compute of sorts, right? Um, a memory layer which is the the VMs and the which which is ha which has a disk as associated with it. The compute worker has like a cache. Uh, the primary storage can be the blob store, right? So this is the so this is a simplified illustration of the architecture I'm describing. Uh, I in the sense the, the author of this. Uh, uh, of this article the core core idea is fairly simple s3 is used as the primary storage of the application rather than local disk that is then a stateless compute layer which often includes local caching 
sometimes there is a memory layer which acts as a sort of hot data layer on top of the blob store uh, though importantly it is not the source of truth persistence layer so source of truth is one uh, is like uh, it's not the source of truth persistence layer okay so s3 is here is used as the primary storage layer uh, the stateless compute is what we talked about that has the cache uh, there is a memory layer which is uh, which is another uh, hot data layer of the blob so hot data layer means anything that is uh, whenever this, uh, the word hot data comes means that that uh, uh, comes up that like usually means that something that has like frequent access right whenever they say something is quote unquote hot is it means that there's frequent uh, reads uh, to it or writes to it typically there is also a disaggregated control plane which both manages secondary meta uh, metadata storage and controls other jobs so control plane is essentially think of it as uh, a way to uh, manage all of these resources uh, intelligently to some sense that's what uh, the, the 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 overarching term uh, terms for when you when someone says control plane that's what they mean. often the data and compute plane uh, resides in a customer's cloud simplifying the deployment of system like this but the control plane resides in the vendor's cloud so basically what this means is when this is a, imagining you as a vendor and as a customer uh, as a customer what would you have in your uh, like e, like uh, let's take the amazon example right what you would have in your uh, uh, your 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 rate or your aws uh, provisioning and what uh, if you're using a, a vendor what they would have right so so you can see the reference of these implementations from Neon. Neon again uh, is is, uh, is is uh, as I mentioned is the Postgres uh, is a serverless Postgres database. So and this yeah so I probably will look at this later. We'll come back to what Neon does. Uh, Snowflake all of them are doing a uh, building a database in S3 is also a canonical read here. Okay. We'll, once we finish this, we might we'll check if we can go there. So anything that we want to talk about, any discussion points. Anything that you face that all of this, I think, makes a lot of sense, right? I don't feel like uh, I ran into anything ambiguous per se. This one. Yeah, made sense. Okay. So benefits of S3 as a backend. Separation of uh, storage and compute. The first most foundational advantage of architecture is that it creates true separation of storage and compute, allowing for efficient and simple auto scaling. If you need to scale reads, you can just spin up new compute workers. Since they are stateless, this takes almost zero time and requires no copy, repartitioning, or rebalancing of data across the workers. This means second uh, second scale auto scaling, like uh, like auto scaling in seconds. That's what they mean. If you need uh, to scale reads, you don't need to wait for repartitioning or reshuffling of data across this in order to properly balance load. Failure recovery is easy because there is no need to hydrate data if rehydrate data if you need to recover a compute worker that goes down. So, so what this means is that if you uh, your your since your compute and your storage are two separate things, right? Your compute is somewhere else, your uh, your storage is somewhere else. You can uh, scale both of them independent of each other, right? Which means uh, and and the, the main thing that they specifically mention here is the compute workers are stateless, right? So what that means is it is not associated to the storage in any sense. Um, uh, other, other than it, the calls that it actually makes, right? If it's if it's uh, if it's through S3, the, the S3 calls that it is actually going to make, all of them are going to be stateless. Just, so that's why it is it can they can be independently scaled without requiring any uh, like like copying over of data, or doing all of the things that any uh, that you don't have to do anything related to data uh, for whenever you are scaling this compute. So that's what this paragraph says. Failure recovery is also obviously easy because like there's again no data to manage you don't need like if uh, let's say if you have a system where like it, it is talking to your local ssd right uh, that means that if you uh, uh, if one of those nodes go down you will uh, you will have to do some mechanism for it to get to the latest data right like uh, like if there are four or five six four or five nodes that are that have on uh, on the uh, i'm just talking about like a very uh, contrived example but this is this can this can happen right like we have like four or five nodes that have the latest uh, in in the data that are all uh, uh, but but there there can be one thing that goes down so you you will have to take some additional steps so that this also comes uh, to uh, it, it is recovered and also comes to what is in sync with, with becomes in sync with all of the rest of the nodes right so that none of that you need to do for uh, uh, when your compute and your storage are independent of each other so size of your compute layer can purely uh, can scale purely as a function of incoming traffic independent of the amount of data being stored this means compute can scale to zero you pay for only exact you pay only for exactly the compute and storage uh, the, uh, for the cost you are using versus one always being over provisioned in a disk architecture and you never need to think about things like upscaling a cluster that is about to run out of disk space so essentially this this means that you can 
run most of the things to to to, to as much as as minimal as possible uh, until you have traffic right especially i think this is like a really good for uh, startups or when you are validating a new idea where you don't don't have to provision uh, a lot of your resources early on so that you know it takes up a a a, a cost cost to your it, it is basically an operational cost that adds on right this big uh, I, again i've seen this time and again that where uh, uh, as much as we like to bash serverless as much as we like to bash all of these uh, advancements uh, having that cost set up earlier uh, can can be uh, a problematic thing for where when you are test, just testing waters right and so that, that is what this sort of means right so the size of your compute layer can uh, scale purely as a function of your incoming traffic essentially when you are testing waters there's no traffic so you can basically just provision all of them and then if things work out they work out you can scale accordingly but if they don't you can call it a day right? so yeah i think this this is really useful in that sense this also means that the coordination requirements are massively reduced in in in, in workable you don't need uh, uh, special leader nodes responsible for coordination or consensus because the compute layer is stateless this ties into a broader concept which is uh, uh, which is this architecture lets you offload a lot of distributed system and storage concerns to your cloud vendor okay so what that means is when you are using this right you don't have to uh, who are your cloud vendor they are going to take care of all of this right so when if you if you uh, from from distributed systems an important conce- uh, concept is called as leader election right leader election is essentially where uh, when when there are like five or six nodes they they have a particular leader who is assigned and there's something called as a leader ca- election and that happens between these nodes and there's something called as a consensus protocol so an example of a consensus protocol is raft right so so you uh, 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 so 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 all of these need to be in place if you are implementing a distributed system right but but if you if all of the, if your compute and your worker pool is like stateless and it is not tied to any of this right you don't have to worry about any of that because your dist- your cloud vendor which is aws in this case uh, this example is going to take care of it right uh yeah other cloud computing is much more expensive than storage and if computing and storage are tight there is no way to take advantage uh, of the price of storage plus for some specific request the demand for computing is likely to be completely unequal to the physical storage of the resource of the storage nodes yeah this makes sense so if you have like heavy requests uh, and all of that right uh, so so when you you usually have like a, a group together sort of a, a mechanism right you when you have computer storage together uh, together if your storage prices are low and if your compute prices are high you're still going to pay high so that's what it means right but if you have like uh, when, when ssd is become cheaper for example right you can uh, or like when your compute becomes cheaper but your uh, your ssds are costly like the reverses can also be true right or something something some scenarios like that not saying ssd can ssd start becoming cheaper but let's say in a scenario where uh, your your storage is costlier but your your compute needs are very very uh, low uh, you cannot effectively uh, go to that particular plan because your computer storage are tight uh if they are independent of each other that means that you can uh, your your pricing can vary based on your incoming traffic right so there's also come so the two factors we saw uh, i mean the, the one main factor we saw is 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 is, is pricing and right? the, the other factor we saw was uh the avoiding yourself from handling the uh, uh, the 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 amount of work that is required to manage a, a distributed system right so that that's the second one that they are talking about okay I think this makes sense. Any anything you want to talk about? Any questions? I've like noted down a few, but at the end of the article, maybe we we'll discuss. No, it's okay. We can we can maybe, do it now. No, maybe it's explained later. That's why. Right. Okay. Okay, uh, offload distributed system and storage concerns. Large cloud vendors like Amazon have spent billions of dollars making their blob stores effectively infinitely available, infinitely durable, and infinitely elastic. Using them as a persistent storage means you get all of this for free. uh i don't know for the, the the far free thing doesn't make it's yeah i i would say it's far free you know that there is an associated cost but it's just that those are no longer your problems it's their problem right right this reduces how much time and effort is needed to solve a the large class of issues traditionally important to solve infrastructure products such as quorum and coordination all right uh, yeah so example we, we talked about uh, raft right as well as storage logic example replication across uh, availability zones file management because amazon has already solved them for you right uh, this is also the thing right where you have like an incumbent who has uh, who has spent a lot of their engineering efforts in, in perfecting the solution for a problem right uh, even uh, even with an infinitesimal amount of engineering resources you may have it might be a not a problem worth solving because uh, 
uh, of, 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 of the logical thing that they have spent a lot of time just perfecting that solution right uh, if there are flaws in those solutions so usually what what happens is if you have they have products there are there are two uh, schools of thought here right like so that there is an incumbent who has been on this for 20 years right but over the period of time people have noticed that there are problems in their uh, in, in their solution right so what what usually happens is you have other companies or other startups other projects who are who set out to solve that exact problem right uh, and there are solutions that where the incumbent has mostly perfected it as and, and does not and people don't have any major complaints with it then that sort of sticks on right this is the second case so the first case for so example in like amazon's use case might be uh, the their user experience for example right uh, understanding aws by itself requires uh, uh, a certification to some extent right and it, it might be it might not be for everyone to just immediately get started so the user experience and their developer experience um, well, needed some improvement and then you had startups who who said that let me take a stab at that and started solving that for that problem a good example is Vercel right they are uh, the whole idea behind Vercel is they, they are also provisioned on AWS they uh, they have compute that is lying on AWS right but they have solved a bigger problem which is uh, which, which which has been apparent for the last 10 or 15 years s3 is on the other side where s3 is, is really good for what it is and uh, for what it does and that's what we, we are suggesting that s3 be used more for even scenarios where you are writing your own storage layer right? so that's this article um, so cloud object okay so Cloud object stores uh, also offer a lot of rich storage features. For example, since blob stores use an immutable file uh, structure where changes are simply appended as new files, new, uh, Neon was able to offer branching via a copy and write architecture. I think we read about copy and write in a couple of videos uh, uh, back, but, but the idea is that whenever you have some uh, so, something uh, immutable, uh, copy and write becomes like sort of the de facto way of doing things, right? So, Let's see, let's read about what I'm assuming like you know what copy and write means, right? Or we can look yeah, at yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah? Let's look at it. Okay, yeah. So Okay. So we read about this in one of yeah. the last. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was referring to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of videos. Uh, I think two weeks, three weeks back. I forgot which one, but uh, I'll probably link it later. Mm. But we have when we are reading about the Prolly Trees video, right? Like understanding Prolly Trees. I think uh, uh, copy and write was the mechanism that they are using because like it was an immutable data structure again. So yeah, we're reading about that. But yeah, okay. So whenever you have, uh, let's say. Uh, referred to as implicit sharing used in computer programming to efficiently implicate implement a duplicate or copy operation on modifiable resources so whenever uh, so copy and write can be implemented efficiently by using a page table this is an is in virtual memory management uh, let's not talk about it in terms of memory is that a simpler explanation is it like each time you write instead of modifying it's creating new correct copy? basically it's, uh, instead of you okay. using in place in your um, mutation right so it is uh, so it is an optimization strategy used the, the fundamental idea is that if there are multiple callers ask for resources which are initially indistinguishable you can give them pointers to the same resource the function can be maintained until a caller tries to modify its copy of the resource at which point a true private copy is created to prevent the changes becoming visible to everyone else so let's say you have your own copy of data the moment uh, uh, this is for this specific scenario but yeah let's say uh, the scenario where you have uh, everybody has their own private co uh, copy of their uh, copy of the f uh, of the same data right but until uh, you try to modify your copy there is no like actual uh, you, then the moment you have you basically create a fork of that you you create your own private copy right but won't it have to reconcile in the end like if there are two what you still need a lock or something like correct 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 two, so 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 there is a, so, so if, so if until that's what i'm saying like everything everybody it is shared until that point in drive right so it is it, it is that, that exactly what you're saying it is a way to solve the concurrency problem right let's say okay let's they're looking at uh, i think if there is an example it might might be easier let's look at example
okay so i think this is editing a document is probably a good example so imagine you have a document on your computer which is 100 pages long you decided you want to decide to create a new document based on this one so you copied and named the copy uh, edited document so without copy and write what the computer would create is a complete a separate 100 page document called the edited document so any changes made to the edited document does not affect your original document so basically without copy and write what happens is your uh, original document itself is edited you, you basically made a copy of the 100 pages document right but with copy and write both of them are on the same copy even if you rename it right but instead it lets both uh, refer to the same set of 100 pages initially only the moment after you start creating uh, your edited document does the computer create the copy of page 5 right so the 100 pages again does not need to be copied just the page 5 which is changed needs to be copied basically think, think of it as a delta between these two right like so, so what is the delta between the original source and what has changed right and then you stay whatever has changed separately that is your private copy so you don't have so so the the original file it still stays but only the the change that is there had used to be uh, what do you call it, saved separately does that make sense then if, yeah i got it but then if again to to try to modify the same part or something same page for some, for example then you'll still like i'm just trying to think like without copy and write i'm thinking like one would lock it then the other would couldn't do it now if Correct. both are trying to copy the same page that would still happen right so Correct. both uh, that would still happen so you are uh, you are talking about a scenario where like uh, this is this is an example of a document and the problem with inherently documents is you are imagining a scenario where you have like uh, like two people editing at the same time this is not that this is uh, uh, th this th this is just ex explaining with that example that, <laughs> that that we are used to using google docs and all of that that we think the moment it says document we are thinking about two people so this is just the same person it's just they are saying this is a resource optimization the example here is that the resource itself is um, it, it is uh, if, uh, the resource itself is not entirely copied over only whatever change is copied over that's that's all the takeaway that you need to take about right what you are saying is you have things like crdts that do conflict resolution yes what you are saying is something called a conflict resolution right so if you if you take in the scenario of a document itself so crdt is help so you need to do something called as conflict free replicated data types so uh, where you know um, so so if there are multiple people who are trying to edit it there is a conflict resolution mechanism that happens uh, to make sure that whoever is the, the the latest update sort of takes over or something like that right it's it's a, it's a crdt is a, a very vast topic Does that answer your question? I'm just, we can ask more. I'm trying to understand how, like, uh, the, like how, I'm, I'm not convinced. I'm sure it does, but I'm not convinced how it helps, like, uh, how it uh, optimizes uh, the, this copy on write thing. Uh, we, we, we're not, we're basically saving 100 pages of not copying over that, right? Like, so if, if 100 pages of data takes some specific amount of memory, you're not, mm -hmm. if you, if without copy on write, you're taking, like, let's say uh, each page takes a, an MB. It doesn't, but I'm just saying, you're already occupying 100 MB, right? You're already taken 100 MB of memory. I'm just doing it one, I know one page does not take one MB, but yeah, just for the sake of simplifying calculations, right? So, uh, but, but if you're saying that if without copy on write, you, you, what you would do is that the first and the second are no, uh, you, you basically create a copy and that, that copy you would have 100 mb now at this point you've already used up 200 mb of your resources right? right that makes sense right but the moment you don't do that uh so if you use copy on right you and each page as you said 1 mb right so you would have the same 100 mb but the additional thing would be that 1 mb right so instead of using 200 mb you're, you're now using 101 mb because what you're doing is only the one page that you edited right that alone is saved uh, saved separately Right. In this case, they are saying page five, right? If the fifth page is changed and that takes one MB, only that you save separately, right? So you've basically mm -hmm. effectively eliminated that storage concern of taking like 99 more MB, right? That's what this enables. Right. But what about in the context I, of like, I think if it's sort of fine. Like, Sorry? I got the context from Google Docs, hmm. like a, but what about in the context of like, I think Oh, like okay. even in programming, I think okay. for variable, how is this used in 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 in, uh, in in data structures? Probably, right? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Aditya, you are saying something. 
Yeah, I was saying I, if you remember when we were going to the Dol TV, Dol mm. TV, right? So mm. this that is a, a gate for I think data, right? Correct, correct. So they also uh, that's that's where we read about this uh, copy on right. Mm. Now this makes sense why they would be using this because that uh, maintaining the same data of correct. every version would be Don't very talk, huge, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, they, so, they, so, yeah, so, they, so, yeah, so, yeah so, they just stole the data. Yeah, yeah, correct. So Dolt Hub is basically is, is it, they have a, a version controlled uh, uh, SQL database, uh, but uh, the the the, uh, the the advantage is that, and the the the, the proletaries is their implementation detail. How they implement is that with 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 that. So they basically they allow you to like think of your database that is just a Git, right? Uh, like database that that sort of mm-hmm. not just a Git, a database that is like one to one of how you'd use Git, right? So that that is what Dolt Hub used to mm-hmm. is doing is where every commit to, uh, you can you can branch you can do all your actions that you can do with Git, right? Similar to that you can do uh, in Dolt Hub, right? You can create your own branches, you can uh, roll back and all of that. And the way they are doing it is is the probability is the implementation that they are using. So for for them to keep track of every uh, version of your previous uh, like change or something like that, right? Okay. So let's leave the example. Mm-hmm. So uh, suppose we have a large array containing millions of elements. We want to create uh just like doing the same thing right it's ex- explaining the same thing you're you're asking about real world implementations of this or can you scroll up uh so array is again i understand array like hmm. probably it's going to copy that index or something correct 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 something like that yes so is it like used for like when there's multiple like when it's like a set of elements or something like it's not so, used for so, like... so let, this is this can be i think easily related right if you have snapshots right how do you roll back without needing to duplicate the entire data set think of this right so you have a snapshot of everything at, at some point of time and you hand uh, like and you want to roll back to the previous uh, data set right instead of you doing it um, uh, so, so your rollback is essentially going to be uh, the, the the snapshot will just have be the delta between your previous state and the current state right right so i think that, uh, they call it multi version concurrency control right that's correct yeah, uh, yeah, yeah yeah right so okay Yeah, so ZFS apparently uh, does use this in the operating systems and immutable data structures. Language that emphasize immutable, like Haskell or certain constructs in Scala, often use Scout to efficiently manage data structures without imp- compromising their immutable nature. So I think in immutable, when, when immutable becomes a thing, that they all always use uh, copy on write. Okay, good. Yeah, I think this clears it up. But yeah, we can we can read more about it at the uh, the end. Yeah. Okay. Good. So that's that. Any anything else that we want to talk about before we move on? I think for me. Okay. Cloud. So okay. So we where where we? Yeah, we were here, right? Uh, offload distributed systems and storage concerns. No, I think we read this. Yeah, I think cost. Yeah, yeah, business model and cost. So S3 as a persistence layer architecture also creates profound advantages from a cost perspective. Uh, the first is related to the decoupling of storage. I think this is repeating the same thing that we already spoke about. The second and more nuanced point is that this architecture is much more suited to the business model of the cloud. The cloud data pricing extracts a huge premium on certain actions over others in a way that extracts immense rent with the local disk storage architecture. When you see S3 as a networking layer which is replicating across availability zones, you are uh, effectively arbitraging the uh, pricing model of the cloud vendors in some ways. Okay. Uh, third, cloud blob storage is exceptionally cheap. Uh, though that is a caveat here, I will get into more later. You need to be careful about how you manage this architecture for low latency or high throughput systems. Uh, yeah, we saw that the co- cost was the main another reason deployment. Uh, okay, I think it goes about the same thing. In particular, using S3 as a storage it makes it very easy to have your data and compute plane run in your customer's cloud because you are not storing the data yourself, but instead it is being stored in S3. Uh, Buckets, you immediately solve a large number of data security issues related uh, in, in a, uh, issues a customer might ask you about. Even better, you can still keep your control plane and metadata plane in your cloud if you'd like. And analogous uh, dynamic can be seen in many of the software vendors over the past few years who use Snowflake as a backend, such as Panther and Apo. It is uh, so much easier for uh, such uh, vendors to deploy. Apply to larger, more uh, security-conscious customers as a result of this architecture. Uh, we were discussing about this, right? Where they are saying, uh, uh, where I was saying that if you are a new vendor uh, and it makes sense for if your if your if your data is backed by S3, it, it instills more confidence. Um, that sort of makes sense, right? Uh, DX is good. Uh, the local disk storage architectures tend to create a lot more complexity by requiring the developer to reason about a st- stateful storage services. So st- storage service, while managed uh, services can partially hide this, the abstraction tends to leak. Right. 
so i think at, up, up until this point we have spoken about all the great things about this right and then after this now we talk about all the problems important the goal of this article is not to say that many of these benefits cannot be achieved by building an infrastructure service with a custom storage layer for example you can certainly achieve separation of storage and compute without building on s3 rather i think there are the, the there are two key takeaways okay building on top of blob stores as a backend gives you all of these things for free this gives us such higher velocity as a startup and as a result opens up a new class of startup ideas to be built that otherwise would have required insane amounts of money and in initial terms i think we, this is one thing that we already spoke about right? it is hard to compete with durability and availability of blob stores again this is also what we talk about if there is someone who is who's been doing this for years uh, it might uh, it might take you a, a lot more energy and a lot more time for you to to reach that particular level so it's also something that we have already talked about of course this architecture is not panache uh, it, it indeed there is a good reason why all the initial adopters of this architecture but analytics oriented more offline systems uh, s3 is not optimized for high iops right and it is used uh, native uh, naively uh, and if used naively is a very expensive to constantly write slash read uh, on the scale of seconds this part of why it is so interesting to now see very operational product categories such as event st- streaming this is warp stream and oltp databases neon adopt this architecture okay so typically uh, you, when you uh, you need the all of these required high io right like a lot of rewrites and reads on uh, at per second level right and uh, this is it is interesting to see how these people are doing it. getting such product categories to work uh, requires some additional work particularly within the following areas okay caching and memory typically a sophisticated caching or hot storage design is required to make an architecture like this work well for example snowflake discusses caching heavily in their original paper a neon space server layer acts as a hot storage cache layer see also the cmu representation by neon oh i think we should we should actually look at this oh uh, it's a video and it's not okay we'll look at this next week or like some other week All of these designs leverage an in-memory cache or a local disk-based cache, a higher tier temporary storage that is not as seen as a durable source of truth, or both as a way of to offset these issues. Okay, so that's either an in-memory cache. So, so the additional work is you, the user have an in-memory cache or a disk-based cache, um, or or both, so that one of the problem you don't run into the issues from one of these two. sometimes this is coupled with the compute layer example uh, the snowflake compute vms have an in memory cache other times it is an independent layer uh, which is uh, uh, example the neon page server distinct from the compute uh, compute workers okay i think this sort of makes sense right like uh, if you are if you if you are dealing with high io um, and another way of offsetting that problem is by making sure that you have some way of caching uh, your reads and writes right So, but the, the read and write strategy also needs some change that's what i think this talks about you can't naively map the same read write strategy used in your local disk design to an s3 back design right the volumes of reads and writes would lead to insane costs or create an io bottleneck in processing right because you can't treat it as uh, like how you are reading your novel files you'll have to do something something additional so to make sure that uh, you uh, you uh, use effectively use s3 as uh, as a service and not use it like your file st- file system right like like just a file system as is careful consideration is required how how often and when you access s3 under this architecture for example do you bundle or batch request under what situation assuming you have a caching or a hot storage layer how do you maintain cache coherence and under what situations do you go to the bob storage versus not so how do you uh, mediate minimize or minimize the number of times you need to query s3 while maintaining a sufficient presence of the or consistency guarantees so that is a trade off right so uh, if when you are going to s3 how intelligent uh, are you managing that uh, request uh, round trip right uh, because because as, as they are saying that uh, and I, as i've also seen in earlier uh, uh, times that sometimes when you are you are hitting uh, uh, the io uh, s3 like uh, at, at at a large uh, like at, at a frequent uh, rate uh, you get things start to uh, uh, hit a particular uh, wall right you can't do it at, at at the rate that you always want it to be and so that is why you need to have some way of caching either uh, that the trade off here be how do you identify that what needs to stay in cache and how like accu- uh, like how up to date that is so that is the cache coherence problem and then how do you know uh, when you when you bundle or batch request so if you are uh, taking like if you in a blob store typically right that is that is uh, that is a way that you can uh, at least s3 offers a way of uh, bundling a lot of their requests into like one one batch or something like that right like so you can you can do that also uh, and you have to the, so the trade off here being you have to identify when do you want to do any of this just to circumvent the problem of having the uh, the io rate that you want right 
so often this is lean this, this is about leaning into s3 strengths uh, which is pseudo infinite parallelism and trying to mitigate its weaknesses which is the relatively high query latency yeah okay anything you want to discuss here sort of makes sense okay so we spoke about that the storage layout how storage is laid out and organized within s3 also requires a dramatic rethinking related to what might have been optimal within uh, with a local base, local display storage for example you may not have with what you may not want to partition files in the same way or you may not be able to make the same assumptions about sequential disk access okay here they are getting around the uh, uh, the the problem of io by making sure that they create a top, uh, uh, a file for every uh, for all of the topics partitions instead of creating one per topic which is the deviation from kafka right? i think that's all the takeaway we should go here the moment we start diving in deeply into the implementation we will 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 lose our track okay metadata management and offline processing okay so we i think this is very small so let's go to that proper metadata management is critical to make architectures like this work key ways in this uh, this take shape include optimizing how s3 is scanned guiding offline processing of the data in order to continuously optimize its layout for the online system to perform well optimizing when the data is queried from s3 versus second resources which is the the cache that you're talking about uh, when to store metadata uh, no no this is not the cache this is the metadata thing is it Amazing data is queried from S3. Correct, correct, correct. So, when to store metadata in S3 or a third-party metadata storage layer, and whether to cache metadata are also important questions to consider. Yeah, for the offline example compaction. So, file restructuring, I understand. Right, making sure that. Oh, okay. So, I think when they when they mean offline, right, before you put your files on S3, right, you'll have to do some sort of pre-processing to make sure that those files are uh, put uh, in in an, in the the right the most optimized way. Right, you want to make sure that your files are uh, structured correctly and all of that. Right. So that's what they mean by offline. Uh, when they say offline processing, I'm assuming that they mean some pre-processing of your files before you put them on the blob storage. Right. Yeah. So, when to store metadata in S3 or a third-party metadata is a question to important questions to consider. Okay, cost. I touched on cost, but it's worth calling out directly. A lot of the I think we're talking about cost again. While S3 is cheap as a storage lay, a storage layer and using S3 as a networking layer for availability, uh, zone replication is very cheap. Naively making thousands of read-write API calls to S3 will create a huge cost burden. As such, this uh, architecture is not inherently more cost-efficient unless you think about the right way to implement it. Uh, startup opportunity what i find particularly interesting is that in spite of the immense benefits of this architectural approach it still represents a relatively small portion of cloud databases and data systems this introduces uh, i have thus far mentioned a place uh, plus a few others so all of these companies and are the main products that i'm aware of that fit this art architectural paradigm there are so many huge infrastructure characteristics where these areas could allow a disruptive and en en entrant to emerge which is search graph databases log analysis time series database olap uh click i think clickhouse db i don't know if clickhouse db uses s3 i think we'll have to find do many of these doing many of these will uh these right will require thoughtful consideration with respect to dealing with the drawbacks of s3 but if done correctly you often have the opportunity to be the first truly service offering service offering to emerge in the in this category as the composable data stack continues to flourish on open formats such as iceberg delta lake table formats parquet i think parquet we discussed right parquet is the is, is, is another data format and arrow memory format continue to improve it is only going to get easier to design systems in this way okay as this pattern becomes more commonplace there will likely also be interesting second order effects for example if most infrastructure becomes a query layer on s3 how will the role of etl change it will be a lot less important to move or replicate data in between n different specialized storage systems but it may become more important to transform across data formats within s3 to optimize for different workload characteristics okay based on whatever the workload you can uh, optimize whatever the file format is uh, but uh, they, they are also saying like how uh, Uh, again this is this is the just going back to the first thought that we had uh, the the cmu database course uh, recommended s3 as the primary storage for uh, a building or like when you're thinking about olap systems right uh, the carnegie mellon course right so um, uh, they are asking how this this change to using s3 as the querying layer how will this have Uh, make may uh, how will this play out in the world of etls right etl is extract uh, transform and load uh, like if you have imagine you have like a large data uh, system how do you manage that and etl is is sort of the way it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a 
blanket term for uh, for for handling with such large data systems but uh, so yeah so how how does that industry change is something that uh, i think is i think uh, I, what they're trying to say is that more and more databases are, are more over systems are starting to use S3 as this particular uh, layer. And we have to see if more implementations or more startups come in this particular, uh, in this way of using S3 as this particular uh, type of uh, storage, right? Okay. So building on object storage also drastically lowers the bar for building a new data system, which should allow for the rise of more vertical infrastructure is what you're talking about, right? So Neon is a really good example of this. Replaced uh, investing in companies, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. But any questions here? I think we might have some questions around Parquet and all of this. I think this might... Uh, we discussed about Parquet in a different context. I don't think we discussed about this here. Uh, but yeah. if it helps, we can, we can look at it. So, uh, so uh, I haven't used Parquet personally, but Ninad has. But so Parquet is is a is a way to store uh, data so in in a, in a columnar format instead of you storing it in rows, uh, Parquet allows you to store data in like a columnar format. So you have instead of you like if, you're, if you're, your typical database is like is mostly uh, row based, right? Uh, or or uh, what they call is tuple based, right? But columnar allows you to do it in a different uh, way. Um, I haven't personally used it, so I can't really comment about it. But yeah. It helps with aggregation. For the last I remember, it is if you if you helps. If you want to look at data it, for in, an, an, in an aggregated way, uh, columnar formats help, uh, right? That if I remember correctly, probably uh, something that to, to to read about further. I mean, if I would have used it, I would have had some appearance about it. I, I don't. So yeah, maybe maybe I, I think you, I'll try to see if I can get something up and running. Try to use it and then see if I can understand it further. I would say probably my takeaway for this is that I should understand this further. But yeah, I think overall we sort of got the idea. This was not too deep, uh, not very heavy. We went, uh, we just understood like the trade-offs in, in using S3 as uh, the mainly, mainly the advantage is not, uh, we didn't talk about the caveats a lot, but uh, yeah, they're only, uh, they, they mentioned this, but, but it also means that you are relying on, one thing that they've not talked about is you are now relying on S3 as like your, uh, what do you call, uh, sort of um, vendor lock-in you could say, but again, uh, Technically, you are vendor locked anyway, right? It's not like vendor locking is the only problem that you you run into. Even if you use any architecture, it's not any any particular cloud infrastructure. You are most likely going to be vendor locked in some form or the other, right? So I don't think that's like an S3 only problem. That's never whenever you go you choose cloud as as a solution, um, it, it might be yeah, it's something that you you face anyway. But yeah, I think overall good article. 